History has a strange way of repeating itself, giving us opportunities perhaps to learn lessons, lessons perhaps not learned on the first go-around. Napoleon and Vladimir Putin do indeed share many similarities. Uh, it is our intent to primarily focus on the main thing they share, and that is, we believe that they basically share the same enemy. And that's something that we will have to spend a little time to document, but bear in mind that will be a key component of what we will be discussing tonight. The enemies of Napoleon essentially are very much the same people, the same entities with the same interest that Vladimir Putin faces in the modern age. Today's video will be concerning two figures in history. One, a current leader, Vladimir Putin, Napoleon Bonaparte. It is our intention to show how they are in very similar situations in history. And in fact, we are going to show that Putin is very much the same position in history as Napoleon. And in fact, he may in fact be a modern day Napoleon. All of us have heard of Napoleon and all of us have heard of Vladimir Putin. But we will not go into a comparison of them as military because they're really not the same. Our comparison revolves them as heads of state and how they behaved as leaders of important countries, essentially important countries in Europe and of the known world. And so with that in mind, we will now prepare to compare uh, the actions, the deeds, and the aspirations of both Napoleon and Vladimir Putin. As we said earlier, our contention is that they basically had the same enemies, even though they may not have had the same goals. And that's good enough to understand and a good enough place to start. So if the enemies of Napoleon's France, our contention is that those same parties, having not been vanquished since the Napoleon era, the power structure that defeated Napoleon, of course, has flourished. and It's had centuries plus to, to gather momentum and accrue allies and, of course, morph into something different. And so, Vladimir Putin and Napoleon Bonaparte had the same enemy. They had other similarities as well. Both took power following major upheavals of long-standing system of rule with Napoleon attempting to restore the monarchy of France with a twist as emperor. Putin took the broken Soviet Union and cobbled together something more closely resembling the Tsar system that the Bolsheviks had replaced. And both had a common enemy, primarily the British Empire, which is now essentially America, Europe, coalitions resulting from the merging of the British Empire with the uh, post-war powers that in name became America, but indeed was essentially the same forces that fought Napoleon, and now they were fighting Russia, and now Vladimir Putin comes to power with that as the nemesis to his daily operation and to his long-term plan. Now here's where it gets interesting because we can all go back in history and we could research all the things that happened after Napoleon was defeated and we could go back and maybe find out the underneath story because there's a lot of, of hidden alliances because the British Empire did in fact engage in many secret alliances to defeat uh, Napoleon. And so what we would like to do here, if we may, is to go back and let's say what would have happened had Napoleon not been defeated. What would the landscape have looked like? And we can take it up to the present day, or we can take it to a, a point where it seems to break down. 
because we want to do that because I think what you will find is that you will find that will show how Putin pretty much has the same trajectory as Napoleon and we're going to give Napoleon the benefit of the doubt of winning and continuing his plans instead of having them abruptly stopped by Wellington at Waterloo. You can't study this part of history without understanding that at that time it was a colonial system. Uh, colonies were the big thing and that was the basis for the British Empire. Now, France also had colonies, but were always behind England, as was everyone. And some of the uh, kingdoms that Napoleon conquered uh, certainly had some colonial interest as well. But predominantly, that was England's game. He tried to have a naval attack and naval forces, but it was always stymied. And of course, that was ended at some point after his victory in Egypt. But it seems as if Napoleon may have actually had a patchwork plan instead of a real plan. He gets credit for trying to be the modern-day Charlemagne to reunite Europe. But it does appear that his real plan was to, if he can't beat England at the colony game, why not make the rest of Europe a colony? And perhaps to large enough to coexist on some sort of equitable terms without having to actually defeat the British Empire. But the British had no interest in having a major competitor. And so that was the basis of the battle, was the British Empire saw a threat in Napoleon in uniting Europe, which would then give the British Empire uh, a major uh, big league opponent instead of the, uh, what the world situation as it was. Now, by defeating Napoleon, they went on to essentially have a world empire. And that's just simply the way it is. But we're going to project it. Napoleon manages to keep his goals intact. Now, we may have to circumvent and stop him from attacking Russia, because that was probably an error. And so, let's do a quick timeline for Napoleon. In 1796, he began his first military campaign against the Austrians and their Italian allies scoring a series of decisive victories and becoming a national hero. Two years later, he led a military expedition to Egypt that served as a springboard to political power. Napoleon engineered a coup in 1799, becoming first consul of the French Republic. Intractable differences with the British meant that the French were facing uh, the War of the Third Coalition by 1805. Napoleon shattered this coalition with decisive victories in the Ulm campaign and a historic triumph at the Battle of Austerlitz, which led to the dissolving of the Holy Roman Empire. In 1806, the Fourth Coalition took up arms against him because Prussia became worried about a growing French uh, influence on the European continent. Napoleon quickly knocked out Prussia at the battles of Jena and Arstadt, and then marched the Grand Army deep into Eastern Europe, annihilating the Russians in June of 1807 at Friedland, forcing the defeated nations of the Fourth Coalition to accept the treaties of Tilsit. Two years later, the Austrians challenged the French again during the War of the Fifth Coalition, taking a, us to the triumph at the Battle of Wagram, hoping to extend the continental system, which was an embargo against Britain. It is here that Napoleon invaded the Iberian Peninsula, one of his series of two large blunders. Now, this resulted in the Peninsula War, which lasted six years. Napoleon's marshals were defeated by Spanish, Portuguese, and British forces. Despite this, 
Napoleon launched an invasion of Russia in the summer of 1812. It was perhaps the worst military catastrophe in history. This encouraged Napoleon's enemies, and in 1813, Prussia, Austria joined Russian forces in a sixth coalition against France. This coalition defeated Napoleon at the Battle of Leipzig on October of 1813. The coalition invaded France, captured Paris, forcing Napoleon to abdicate in April of 1814. Napoleon was exiled to Elba. In France, the Bourbons were restored to power. However, Napoleon escaped from Elba in February of 1815, took control of France without spilling any blood. The Allies responded by forming a seventh coalition, which ultimately defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, setting in motion the geopolitical pattern we have today. So this is where we intend to juxtapose history to today. It is our belief that Putin is working on positioning Russia to be in a similar position that Napoleon would have been in and have enjoyed had he not committed the serious blunders of Spain and Russia. But the real story is the coalitions, seven of them, were formed to stop Napoleon. And at the center of all these coalitions was British aid and British intent. And so that establishes Napoleon's true enemy, despite the fact there were seven various coalitions. His true enemy was England. And of course, the distrust of the Europe that he was trying to, uh, to unify. And so that is kind of a little background for Napoleon, for those of you who haven't really studied it. And now we will see where Putin fits in. And hopefully we can connect the dots and we'll see that Putin is in a very similar to position that Napoleon was in at one time. Not perhaps at his, at his end, not at Waterloo, but there was a point in Napoleon's trajectory where he could be where Putin could be also very easily. And that's kind of where we're trying to get to here. At the time that the Soviet Union broke apart, just a few years later, in 1992, uh, the, the EU was formed, the European Union. Now that's interesting because what that does, with a stroke of a pen, pretty much created the, the kingdom or the power that Napoleon should have had had he not made the mistakes of going to Spain and going to Russia, he could pretty much have had something similar to the EU, of course, without Britain. And so the EU worked with the United States pretty much uh, as a NATO countries. And so the, it simply was this uh, an expanded American British empire, but the British, the EU was not exactly in lockstep with those two. And so the EU forms this continental uh, republic that it seems that it seems like Napoleon was trying to cobble this together. So we're going to give him credit for the EU being what Napoleon had envisioned. And then what happened uh, several years ago when Britain left the EU, now that puts Russia in a position to work with this EU, very similar to what the Russians weren't going to do in Napoleon's day, but since the EU is now not, it's minus Britain, and that left the EU vulnerable, and they became a very cooperative with Russia, Russia especially supplying most of their energy and, all, and lots of other things, and so the European Union became closer, working closer with Russia than the West, than the, than the American British were. And so I believe that's where it all turned, is that Putin spent the time 
while the EU was going from 92 to the Brexit stage, just trying to reestablish Russia. But since EU has started to falter and also has become expansive, Russia has seen that as a threat, a very similar threat to what they saw with the British Empire back in Napoleon's day. And so Putin has tried to work his way through negotiations and through all sorts of ways of dealing with the EU and the United States and just the world stage he's working on. He is coming to a situation where he, Putin, pretty much, at least geographically, more or less represents or is in position to represent the old Holy Roman Empire, which, of course, Napoleon ended. And so things have a way of going right back to where they started. And so our contention is that perhaps even this Ukraine situation today has some, something in common with the, the ultimate goal of Putin and Russia. And of course, that is kind of where we have to sort of stop and say, well, what is Putin's aim? What is Russia's aim? Are they just trying to survive and be a country? Or do they have uh, some aspirations of attaining something similar to the Holy Roman Empire? Or perhaps getting control of the EU as it slowly falls apart because they see it as a threat. Almost the opposite as Prussia saw Napoleon as a threat. Putin sees the EU as the same kind of threat. And so that leads to a very important point in geopolitics. And I think that's the purpose of this video is to try to take another look at geopolitics and try to understand what's really happening. Because Putin has taken Russia from a no religion to almost a theocratic type of government. So he certainly is working on something similar to the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, there's a lot of religious right uh, mentality in Russia, uh, and that does not mix with the EU's mentality. So his battle now is, it's a similar group of people. It is the coalitions that fought Napoleon. That is the enemy now of Putin. And to a lesser extent, America is not really as big a part of that coalition as you might think, even though it's certainly a big part of it. Now, even though Russia is now technically a capitalist country, or it's certainly not a pure communist country, uh, it, uh, you would think that the ideological war that America had with Russia would have ended. And perhaps it did to a certain extent, but they still kept their NATO organization. It was not dismantled, and now it's simply a European uh, defense mechanism. And Europe has used it to basically slowly annex parts of what were once the Soviet Union. And so the Soviet Union, uh, the Russia has to look at what they're doing with a certain, they have to take a certain approach. And this past week, there was the so-called invasion of Ukraine. Now, Ukraine was poised to become a part of NATO. So it does seem that Putin is taking kind of the long game because Putin believes that the, the, the EU especially and the West in general is morally decadent and he does not think that their, their economic system is viable. It seems like he's playing a waiting game slowly but surely becoming more and more important to Europe, especially in energy. And so this gets tangled, and it's probably beyond my pay league to try to figure out who's zooming who here. But the, the, the way Americans look at Russia needs to be re-examined, and that's really another reason why we're doing this video. And our contention is that even though Putin may not have the same ideological look that, that 
uh, Napoleon had, he still is in a position, if he plays his cards just the right way, to be in the position that Napoleon could have been in had he had something in mind other than simply military glory and used his, played his cards a lot more intelligently uh, because there's a kingdom there waiting to be had and Russia and Europe have always had some common ground. And it seems like at some point, take it 10 years down the road perhaps, I think we'll find that they will in fact become much more, work more closely together. But right now, Putin finds himself in the same position as Napoleon in the sense that his enemies are pretty much the same ones that were Napoleon's enemies. But Putin is taking a drastically different approach. So with Putin trying to play the long game and waiting for the decadent West to fall apart, especially the EU, piece by piece perhaps, Putin stands poised to take the same exact position that Napoleon did himself before he made the ominous decision to invade Russia in one of the worst military decisions possibly ever. But Putin does not play that sort of game. He is not the warrior that wants to win battles and glory. As I said, Putin has played the waiting game. And there's no reason to think that he will try something different this late in the game. So probably only Putin himself knows what he has in mind. He does have pretty much total control of the country. He is, in effect, as powerful as Napoleon was in France. He is the absolute ruler of a country that, with a few right moves, could be in the very same position that our friend Napoleon could have been as well.